in the face! <laughs> Thank you. Hello and welcome to Hey Not the Face with your host John Nash and your producer, me, Steffi Haynes. And today we're going to talk about PFL contracts. But before we do that, let's check in with John and see how he's been since last time we talked. Good. That's it? Just good? That's it. No, good. My mom's visiting. She's in town. She's in the other... Oh. She took over the main room, so I've moved into the office guest room. So. Oh, well, you know what? Glad to hear your mom's in town. I hope you're treating her to all kinds of movies and good food. We, I'm treating her to the best food that I possibly can. Pink chili dogs. <laughs> so, And the good news is my girlfriend's out of town as a vegan, so that means my mom's free to eat whatever she wants. So. Oh, that's that's even better. But the bad news is Issa the cat hates my mom. What? Just hates her. Hates her. Why? I have no idea. Just just hates. Well, she hates anybody coming into this household. That's what it is, is because yeah. she's a daddy's girl and anybody else in the household is taking her attention away. Well, she hates me, too. So oh, she does not. She does now. She used to be all loving, but now she'll whack me for having every time she sees my mom come in the house. She's <laughs> mad at me for letting her in. <laughs> oh, so that's great. Terrible, terrible. Pin, I'm on pins and needles all the time, worried that this eight and a half pound cat could just go off of me at any minute. <laughs> well, you know who is also on pins and needles? Probably all the PFL fighters. Now, we're going to talk about the PFL contract, but first, let's talk a little bit more about the UFC settlement, because I bet they're also on pins and needles wondering what their settlement's going to look like, if they're going to get one, when they're going to get one. So let's just see if you have any final thoughts about what went down back on March 20th. Well, my main thought is that we had a lot of content planned that we were going to record and post before the trial <laughs> that we are now, we don't have. And that's why there was kind of a little gap here between the last content and, and now's podcast. So, because we had a, you know, we had a, we had a pivot. It's like pivoting a battleship here. But so that's my number one, that we were the big losers <clears throat> because we had done all this work, even though we kind of thought there was going to be a settlement. I thought it'd be right up to the trial date. I thought it'd be much closer. So I thought we had some time, but anyway, my, um, I mean, I mean, one thing is I think a lot of people are kind of caught off guard and uh, surprised by the amount and that there's it looks like there'll be no injunctive relief or I, I think there'll be contractual changes. But like I said, they're purely going to be cosmetic. They're going to be no real changes to the contract. And that who said that to you as soon as the settlement happened? Who said that to you first? I did. Yes. Yeah. Be, well, you can kind of you can kind of read that it's mm -hmm. you just the, the tone of the settlement was, um, and the, the, that's the part that kind of surprised me about the case more than um, the amount. Uh, I did not think I thought they would settle for you know under five hundred million. Probably I was pretty. I said repeatedly under five hundred million. In fact, on some of them, I said to other people lower amounts. But I at this point I started thinking it might go a little higher, up to close to five hundred million. So it's a lower settlement. But I thought there might be some contractual changes. But when you look back, I think there's a couple things people missed. Me too. We pointed them out, but I don't think I understood how how important these things were. And the things that I think people missed was that, one, the splitting of the class, the fact that there was a Johnson class. If people remember the judge back in 2020 verbally said he's granting class certification. And then in April – said he's going to release the written opinion of class certification, right? The written order, officially granting class certification so the case could move on at that point. But right before he did that, the UFC introduced the Oleon case decision, which which laid a new um, – an, th that decision set a new ground um, – a new uh, – New standard, I guess you could say, for class certification that they claim the UFC's the plaintiff's case case to admit, and so the the case froze for two years. And because the case froze, when you got to July first, two thousand twenty one, that means every new fighter, their statute limitations were up on their case, right? So they were they were forced out of the the suit, and so. They were, I guess we call they're being prejudiced against that they're being you know they have they have no they have no case now and so the plaintiffs filed a motion so those fighters would have a lawsuit but what that did is it created two classes 
And because now there's two classes in the class action, the current group, the Lee class, the first one, doesn't have standing to, for injunctive relief. We thought they might because the judge said, but at the end, they didn't have standing. The judge was not going to let them change the current contracts. So that, that would be the Johnson case would be the ones that group of fighters, their suit would have the chance to change the contracts. The Lee class didn't have the power anymore, that that cudgel, that threat to the UFC that we that we can force change on you that would force the UFC to settle for a, probably a larger amount. That's that's one thing. And the other thing we missed, too, is the inter- – we didn't miss. We pointed this out. But we didn't consider the ramifications, I think, of the class action waiver that was introduced. Uh and that was kind of a fluke, too. It took the the Trump administration's NLRB, Peter Robb, writing an amicus to the Supreme Court to look at this case. They look at it, the the fact that Trump appointed Gorsuch, a new, uh, a new attorney, I mean, a new Supreme Court justice, was the tie-breaking vote to suddenly say that uh, arbitration clauses in contracts were constitutional, and class action waivers, too, were constitutional. So the UFC... Starting in 2021, introduced class action waivers, and and not only just class action waiver for new fighters. They have some really just, I think, some terminology uh, in those contracts that seem patently illegal. They basically say if you get this agreement and you continue to work for the UFC, that that means you've agreed to the arbitration clause without even signing the agreement. I don't know how that upholds in court. But that's what it says. So every not only did every fighter from that point on now fall under the class action waiver, so that's half the fighters in the Johnson class. If you signed it or part of that, if you're if you have that class action waiver, that also covers all your previous fights since 2017. Whoa, whoa, so, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, John. Uh, I, I have to buy, break in and ask you a question here. If yes, I may, yes, yes. Because go ahead. I need you to clarify. Are you saying that just by virtue of them handing you a contract to review to sign, by virtue of them giving you the contract, even if it's not signed, you fall under that purview? That's what the that's what it says. What uh, is it, the is it, hell? It, it doesn't sound, I mean, I, I don't know in any way that would be legal, but what it basically says is fighter understands that fighter signing of this agreement to arbitrate is not required for the agreement to arbitrate to be enforced. If fighter begins or continues working for Zufa after receiving this agreement to arbitrate, the, this agreement to arbitrate will be effective and fighter will be deemed to have consented to ratified and accepted this agreement to arbitrate through fighters knowledge of it and commencement of or continued performance of activities or work under the agreement with Zupa. So in other words, if you're in the UFC around 2021, when this class was split and you got this contract, well, to continue to fight with the UFC, you had to sign this agreement which meant you have a class action waiver now in the contract. But it also says if you got this contract and you chose, you know what, I don't want to sign this. I'm going to fight out my contract. Well, because you continue to fight for the UFC, you consented to this agreement that says. But you're not. You haven't signed that agreement. You're still you ha- signed to a previous agreement. I, yes. I Again, you're, you're asking. We, I have I have reached out and, and everybody's like stumped by this because they don't see how it's legal. But at the same time, this is what the UFC issued. So so what you got to look at is that class period, to get back to my point. I'm sorry, I'm just I, bowled over by I, this. I'm bowled over too by this. And it's something I pointed out before, and I kind of just kind of you know zoned over. But half the fighters then in the Johnson class probably signed this agreement. But because fighters in the Johnson class had previous fights in Johnson before they got this agreement – it's not half the fighters and half the fights that took place from 2017 on are covered by the class action waiver. It's probably three quarters of the fights Mm -hmm. are covered by the class action waivers. And because higher, the top fighters, the higher paid fighters are more likely to resign and be in the UFC longer. It's more likely they sign these class action waivers. So it's not just 75% of all fights are covered. That's basically 90% of all compensation paid to fighters are probably covered by this waiver. So they were taken out of the class. And, and what makes this important is because you got to understand the, the plaintiff's position. I think they found themselves in, they're going into court for the, the, the Lee trial, which is more limited, you know, 2010, 2017, only asking for damages. Right. And there's a possibility Zach Arnold brought this up that independent contractors on their mock juries were not favorable to the plaintiff. So you got to worry that, 
we have to convert all eight jurors to, to, to vote in favor of us. If we can't get one or two, we could lose. So they have to be concerned about that. But the only threat they had to the UFC is the damages for the league class. Because let's say the plan was decided we're going to fight this out and they win the league class. Now they got to go in to discovery and build up a case for the Johnson class. Well, the plaintiffs are going to be looking at tens of millions of dollars spent researching to try to get injunctive relief. And at the end of that trial, there'll be no damages because there's no fighters in the Johnson class. They all sign this class action waiver or fall under it. And so you're asking the attorneys to spend tens of million dollars and, and basically lose money or break it if they win all on behalf of trying to get injunctive relief. And I think that's the part I missed because there was no possibility of this case continuing for the, the them launching the Johnson case after this because there was no financial incentive anymore. That was completely removed by this class action waiver. And so the attorneys uh, were faced with all we have is the Lee case to threaten the UFC with. All it is is damages that that makes the, that puts the leverage back in the UFC's hands. We've got to settle and we cannot because we can't threaten injunctive relief at all. Uh, the, 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 the plaintiffs, the defendants, I mean, can, can push, can offer a lower rate than they would if there was a bigger threat of injunctive relief on the table. Insane. Insane. I can't get over that. And I hope somebody looks into the legality of, of those clauses in that contract, because wow, I can't get over that. You don't even have to sign it. You're under the purview of another contract already. But by virtue of them having you look at this new contract, you, you're automatically what? So yeah, how did uh, Francis well, it, it, get out then? Yeah, well, Francis, remember, he signed his contract was signed in 2017. This but, waiver was installed in 2021. And so, I mean, it's possible they, they sent Francis this contract waiver. And it's possible, I mean, remember, his contract ended and he left, but it's possible they're claiming uh, in Ghana, you no matter even though you signed and left the UFC, you still this arbitration clause still stands. You know, if, if you wanted to take us to court or join a class action lawsuit against us, so he might have been removed. At least in their minds, he might have been removed from the uh, from the Johnson class period. Hmm. And even though he left us, you know, same with Nate Diaz. If Nate Diaz got this, they might claim that Nate Diaz. You can collect damages for Lee, but you're not part of the Johnson class. No, what I mean is. They could have been under the the terms of the class waiver because they were still there when the waivers went into effect. That's what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah. So, holy crap, you know, maybe the UFC was correct in saying that they let Francis go. Well, they they well, they let him go because his contract had ended. They they made it sound like they cut him. Well, that, that that's what I'm saying was may, maybe they I, I, I realized that his contract was up, but if he already had the class waiver and from what you're saying, if the class waiver says that even though you you're 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 finishing out your old contract because we gave you this one, because remember, Francis yeah. said they kept giving him new ones. Yeah. So yeah. because they gave him those, he could have feasibly and I'm using my big, heavy air quotes still been under contract. Right. Because, well, because of that class waiver. Yeah, I, I got. Yeah, I got to be clear. What? Yeah, he would be under he, this agreement would still stand according to them mm -hmm. for for the parts about the contract lawsuits concerning the contract. So if he okay. took part in a class action lawsuit, then he was still under this agreement. Uh, if he took suit him over the contract, he would have been under this agreement. But because he left the UFC, yeah, he's no longer under the terms of the uh, okay. you know the the rest of the contract. But only the, the what they claim here, the only party still under terms of this contract is the the fact that he cannot sue them uh, for yeah, yeah, class yeah. action stuff. So, okay. yeah, but I again, cross... yeah, that's under this um, terms is if Nate Diaz got this, he could not be part of the Johnson class. Neither could Engano, yeah. which means when the plaintiffs were trying to sue the UFC and they would have gone ahead with the next class action. The damages Nate Diaz suffered uh, in his last few last three fights or whatever, four fights after signing this deal, or yeah, or four or five fights even, that that would be excluded because he's not part of the class action. The same with Nganu. Same with everybody that 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 falls in the, under this class action this this arbitration clause and class action waiver, which means again that they were looking at spending tens of millions of dollars potentially 
for a case in which there was no monetary damage they could get back. They would just be losing the money, the attorneys. And obviously the attorneys are not going to do that. Yeah. I crossed my wires there. I was thinking that um I was thinking that the sunset clause would be um null and void because of all the rest of the language. It's basically only about suing. And I am crossing my wires here. So I'm Yeah, glad it's you it's set forgivable. Me There's a lot of stuff in there. It's hard yes. to keep track of all this nonsense. So I'm glad you were able to set me straight. So any final, final thoughts after those pre-final thoughts before we jump into these pfl contracts well i guess i guess my final thought is this is the the end of this whole avenue of uh of change for the ufc the original plan was we are going to sue the ufc we're going to collect damages for the fighters uh and we're going to force the con the courts or the ufc to accept changes to the contracts and if the ufc doesn't and we win we'll just come back and sue them again but because of the clause that was introduced um, because they, they found that arbitration clauses and class action waivers forced on people are constitutional, uh, the, that whole avenue is gone, and that there's no threat from that in the future going forward for the UFC. Uh, and it is kind of remarkable. There is a theory of, uh, of mono- uh, evidence of monopsony power is that if one side Hank gives one-sided contract, does changes to a contract that are one-sided and issues it to the other side, and everybody on the other side signs it, that's evidence of monopsony power, mm. which we just got a big demonstration of monopsony power here. They, big time. Uh, they... <laughs> big time. Oof. Anyways, we are actually going to get into our subject content now, and I'm going to just dive right in with my first question because I'm actually looking at a contract here. It's a PFL contract, but it's a big one. So, John, tell me, what are we looking at and how did we come across it? Well, we're looking at uh, Manuel Sosa Aruja. I hope I pronounced it. It's Portuguese pronunciation. It's terrible by me. So his contract with the the PFL that uh, he had signed with them back at the end of 2022, and he had filed a lawsuit, uh, a, a suit against them in Brazil, uh, claiming breach of contract, and he wanted out of his contract, uh, and that was filed in Brazil. And so we got it because uh, Elton uh, uh, Costa, um, a MMA advocate, reporter, attorney in Brazil, he got access to it because it was in the Brazilian system, and he made it known to everybody in the wider world. So hats off to him. And because of his work, we've got a copy of it that we can peruse Thankfully, PFL does all their work in English, so it's in English, so we can follow along, but that's where we got the contract. All right. Now, if we look at the exclusive promotional fighter agreement, section four terms, what does that part say? Well, if you give me one second to get two back to my contract after everything else we just went through, uh, exclusive fighter contract uh, section four we're looking at. Okay, mm-hmm. well, first of all, we should note there's the, they do their contracts a little bit different. It's it's separate in two parts, uh, the PFL contract. So there's we're going to be in the first se- section right here. And the terms talks about basically the length of the contract. You know, we see this in all, uh, all MMA contracts are the same. They, they have a term period that talks about how length when it starts the effective date here is basically when you sign the contract and it ends at the january 2nd 2024 uh at the which would be after his first season the pfl would have been his first season would have been the 2023 season now that's the initial term but according to this contract there's also they have a renewal option first renewal option and they should have the right to an option to a second year if they want it solely up to the pfl then they have a second renewal option, so it means they can get up to three years with the PFL, right? Right there. Then there's a champion renewal option. If in the third season he becomes the champion, he's automatically renewed for a fourth year. And then there's an extension period. If he's unable to complete a season or out or whatever for any reason and unable to continue through the whole season, they can have an option to add one more year. So that one year initial term could easily become a five year contract. Uh, with no decision whatsoever being made by uh, uh, Mr. Sosa for his part in that. Now, I have to have you clarify one thing. When you say for any reason, are we also talking about injuries? 
Yeah, if he gets injured halfway through the season, mm-hmm. yep, that's that's a hundred percent covered. The the season would go on. Uh, and what's interesting about this is, as everybody knows, I'm a big fan of boxing and I follow boxing history and stuff like that. But this five year contract really, really reminded me of something. And then I remember what it was back in back in March of twenty fourth of nineteen ninety eight. We're going way back. Fred Levin, the attorney of Roy Jones Jr., did appeared before the congr- congressional hearing uh, about this was the Ali Act hearings at the time, and he talked about long contracts, right? And he said the option is very closely akin to the long term promotional contract. The long term promotional contract contract usually takes place earlier in the fighter's career and would say that the promoter has the exclusive right to promote the fighter for three years plus an additional two years after winning a major championship. This is basically the total total career of the fighter. The effect of the option and long-term promotional contract is to force a fighter into an unconscionable arrangement to be represented by someone who has a direct conflict of interest with the fighter. If the fighter refuses, he never gets a chance for I for his career after that, and so you think about it, that five year PFL contract pretty lines up to a five year long term promotional contract in boxing, which we no longer have. Well, we still got it, but there's a lot of there's more protections in right. boxing now because of the the you know the the lack of course of contracts and options. So it's you can still have it. It's at the beginning of a guy's career, but it's let's say the the bo- the boxer would still have some leverage in his career. What about Section 6, compensation? How does that work for this contract? Well, that's kind of interesting because they have, they divide it in basically three parts for payment, right? He has what's called a development bout. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, the development bout is basically any bout that doesn't play, take place in the season. So PFL can offer you extra bouts or off-season bouts. And for those, uh, he would get paid $5,000 to show. And five thousand, if you want, the athletic commission declared him in the winner. And for each win, his pay and his show and win bonus would go up fifteen hundred dollars. So it's you know below UFC minimum, but basically like contender status. But in the regular season, for each regular season fight, he'd be get paid eight thousand to show, eight thousand to win, and then an additional three thousand dollars every time he won. That 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 base pay would go up. And then finally, for the regular season, that payment. If there was a quarterfinals, there doesn't have to be, but there's a quarterfinal, he'd get $25,000 a show and $25,000 if he won. In the semifinals, the final four fighters, in the playoffs, $25,000 a show, $25,000 to win. And if he was in the championship, he'd get $50,000 a show and $850,000 to win. So a grand total of the playoffs of $1 million. So when people talk about the PFL $1 million champion, you don't get a one million dollar check at the end. You get one million for winning all your playoff, uh, your playoff fights. They have the right though to drop that first round. In which case, that fifty thousand dollars would still go to the championship award, the winning. So all the other payouts would be the same, and you'd get nine hundred thousand uh, dollars if you won it all. Wait, what? So if instead of if they did, if they got rid of the. The, the quarterfinals and only did the semifinals and championship in the playoffs. In other words, instead of eight fighters making the playoffs, only four make it. Well, they drop that. Those, the payments stay the same. The semi, the semifinals, you get 25,000 to show 25,000 to win championship. You get 50,000, but now instead of an $850,000 bonus for winning the championship, you get a $900,000 bonus. So you're back to a million dollars. I see. Okay. All right. And that, it was a little confusing there the way you said it, but when you reiterated it, I understood it better. Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm known for that, making things very confusing. <laughs> now we like to check on the incidentals. So when we get to section eight, what do the PFL fighters get there? Well, I don't know why we've gotten caught up in the incidentals, but we do get caught up in those a lot. <laughs> Uh, you get when you go to a fight, you get a flight, two economy class domestic round trip airfares for a fighter in one corner. So basically, the same as everybody else, you get uh, PFL. PFL will pay for ground transportation uh, around. You get a room, one room, one single standard hotel room uh, for up to five nights before the event. Very similar to a lot of the other promotions, right? You get a meal. Though you get a total of one hundred dollars. 
per per room night that you stay there. But the meal allowance is for the fighter only. So it does your corner that you bring does not get a meal allowance, just you. Uh, and you also you have incidentals for promotional activity. So if you're if you're being flown out to promote an event, you're getting one economy flight for that. You get a room and you get the same hundred dollar meal per day uh, while promoting events. Okay. Um, is there anything noteworthy in Section Eleven, which is PFL's code of conduct? Well, it's it's noteworthy that they're going to spell it out in the uh, the next section. We get to that, we'll spell more of these code of conducts. But they do have a set out terms and condition that the fighter agreed to, uh, and th- that's basically it. you have to you have to be professional and respectful, conduct yourself integrity, and serving as a role model in MMA. Uh, fighters, and this is the one thing I brought it up though, because we we talk about this a lot, me and you. Fighters and their teams are not permitted to bet on PFL events under any circumstances. So you notice they they make that clear. The betting is very important here. That they are they are looking out about gambling on PFL events. Did that happen after the UFC's gambling probe a couple of years ago? I I I think it actually might have come about as the PFL uh, issue when remember that uh, when the the fights mm-hmm. were announced uh, were tape recorded that they inserted this but it could have been from the UFC I, I have to go back and compare to older contracts but as we go through this you will see that gambling becomes much more important uh, in this contract than it was in contracts years past. What about when we go to Exhibit A terms and conditions? Under promotional rights and MMA bouts, who, according to Section 3.5, gets to determine the rules? Well, this isn't surprising, uh, but it is a little different than other sports. All combative and non-combative rules of the MMA bout and PFA, and PFA rules should be solely determined by PFL. Right now, they have to follow the rules by state commissions and stuff, but they have the the sole arbitrator of the rule. In other words, they tell you exactly what rule you're going to follow. Rules you're going to follow, and this isn't very uncommon in MMA because overseas there's not athletic commissions, and so the promotions often take over the the, the operations of the athletic commission. Also, there's a lot of leniency of how the rules are going to work. But it's interesting because promoters generally don't have this power in like boxing and stuff. I think there's a, there's a sanctioning, you know, organization in, in um, boxing that often dictates the rules, how, what the rules are going to be fought under uh, in um, other sports. You have the league that does it, but I just thought it was kind of nowhere that MMA, we let the promoter determine the rules. Section four promotional activities. What is expected of the fighters? Well, th- there's a bunch of stuff expected of them, right? Uh, they, one thing is they're expected to do all the stuff, you know, they're expected to market and advertise publicity, promotion, all the stuff that we generally expect in the the fight business. They, they, you know, they have lists, they got to do certain press conferences, television, print, radio, all that stuff. So I'm going through just the basics, but what's kind of interesting too, is that the fighters participation, there's some penalties that they don't take part in those things. Right. Uh, PFL has a little different than the other promotions. They they penalize uh, financially much more the fighters that that fail to live up to their agreements. And uh, one of them is the it says here the fighters' participation in the promotional activities is a material provision of this agreement. And fighters' failure to per- participate as reasonably required or directed by PFL following reasonably advanced notice shall constitute a material breach and shall entitle PFL. One, to terminate this agreement with no further obligations to fighter, or two, impose a penalty of one thousand U.S. dollars per infraction, what? subject to UFC's, uh, subject to PFL, not UFC. Sorry, subject to PFL's prior written approval. PFL agrees to reimburse fighter for this reasonable documented out-of-pocket uh, costs uh, actually incurred by fighter in connection with participation for promotional activities. So, so if you miss something, right? If you fail to do a video shoot, promotional, any sort of marketing campaign or whatever, they can file you $1,000 per infraction. infraction. Fine you. Fine you for $1,000. Well, yeah, fine you. What did I say there? File. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, close enough. Wow. One letter off. I am stunned by that. That just seems uh, a whole lot, a whole lot of when it don't need to be. Yeah, there's, uh, it's, you know, it, it it's, I, I will point out that. The PFL contracts, like I said, they're 
and this is we've looked at them in the past. This one seems slightly more uh, draconian, pun, uh, punitive for re- mm-hmm. missing actions. And there's more. We're not even done with the uh, section four yet, right? This goes with the fighters, uh, basically the sponsorship deals and stuff. And the fighters are, you know, they're allowed their own patches if they get approval. So fighter agrees that no logo shall appear on a fighter's person or body or on cloth or clothing worn by a fighter, fighters, corners, trainers, seconds, or assistants during about all the other promotion activities, all the other stuff like that, um, unless the the uh, the PFL gives them permission. And there's a long list, especially if they can't conflict or compete with the requirements of any telecasters or broadcasters, and then represents any you know uh, any gaming company, media company, beer. They go through a long list of stuff. You can't. In fact. Um, uh, Danny Rubenstein, the manager, posted, uh, tw- tweeted once a while ago all the stuff that was excluded from his fighter from getting putting a patch on his uniform for sponsorship and basically excludes everything, right? So all that is excluded, although the fighter is allowed to have a patch or two if if they can find a sponsor that doesn't conflict with the PFL, which is very hard. Now, fighters shall submit. This is section 4.4 for those following along. Fighters shall submit to PFL for its approval. The name, identity, logos of all identifying elements of sponsors. So you got to go through that, right? Should a fighter attempt to display any name, identity, logo, or other identifying element of a sponsor that has not been pre-approved in writing by PFL or its affiliates, PFL may deem such an act as a material breach of this agreement. PFL and its solo and and sole, sorry, its sole and absolute discretion shall have the right to cause fighter to immediately remove such unauthorized element. Have fighters seek immediate approval and release of the right to display any such element or remove fighter from participating in the LMA, MMA bout without compensation to fighter. PFL reserves the right in its sole discretion to alter any of the policies included without limitation, its policies concerning fighter sponsored at any time. So, in other words, the basically as we we laid out earlier, the the fighter has to get PFL approval, and it's off to the, the fighter's the responsibility to find out if they have approval or not. Wait, uh, can oh, I sorry? ask a question? Go ahead. There at the end, you said something that we can change the, the we can change this at any time. Did you say that? Yes, I did. They t- to alter any of its policies, including what li- limitations oh its policy God. concerning fighter sponsors at any time. So in other words, if they approve your sponsorship uh, at one point, they can come back the next day and say, sorry, that's been excluded. No, we changed. Uh, the policy has been changed and what's been agreed to. Sounds to me like they're mimicking UFC so that they can make sure that the only sponsors available inside a PFC K- PFL cage is a PFL sponsor. Am I basically, getting that right? That is that is basically correct. They're I think they're trying to have their cake and eat it too. They're trying to give fighters the right to have some sponsorship by showing, oh, you know, we don't take all the sponsorship you can have it. But basically it's like, well, the we sponsorship this- we're letting you have is almost useless because we have taken all the sponsorship rights. Yeah. So all of this this hullabaloo that Don Davis likes to put out about come on over to us where you can have your own sponsors is a bunch of bullshit. Well, I, I don't remember him saying that, but I'm sure he probably did. But it, yes. it is interesting to note, Bellator, that was a big deal. And it was true mm-hmm. for Bellator. They were much more lenient on sponsorship with Bellator. Uh, the Bellator event, they were wearing, I, I, I minus, they were wearing, when I remembered correctly, the last event, they were wearing the, the kit uniforms. Yeah. And- See, the thing is, is when Don said that was when he was trying to talk up how much better Francis Ngannou's contract is. And one of the points that he made, I, th- I believe it was to Ariel Hawani. It's been several months ago, but one of the points he made was that Francis would have the ability to have his own sponsors. Yeah. On- well, Francis's contract does. It lets him, although it only gives him, I think two sponsors, but they've been pre-approved uh, and they get a uh, prominent position. So but, but his he made it sound like though, that that yeah. was a normal thing. He didn't yeah. say that it was a special circumstance. So when Don Davis is out there on these interviews talking up the PFL and why you should come to the PFL, that's always in his in his lexicon there. So I yeah. just we, we, that just freaks me out that that part that we can go ahead and change it at any time and you get to have your own sponsors that don't counteract ours, which is basically every sponsor. 
Yeah. Well, the the thing you got to remember, Don Davis, is he he was a, a businessman, but mm-hmm. he is now officially a promoter. Mm-hmm. And you cannot believe a word a promoter says. This is true. This is so true. All right. Let's get back to this contract. Now, you highlighted a section, exclusivity. What happens if a fighter breaches this section? Well, it's common for the promotion of exclusivity over a, an event, right? The, the image and stuff. Uh the, the promotion event, all that is the, the promotion's exclusive right um, and also to the fighter being promoted by him. But if a fighter breaches it or defaults under this section or it shall be deemed to be a breach of a material provision of this agreement by fighter, if fighter fails to comply with this section, PFL shall have the right to seek an immediate and permanent injunction without the requirement of posting any bond as may be required by a court of competent jurisdiction. Additionally, if the fighter breaches any provision of this section, PFL will be substantially damaged and a dollar amount of such damages will be difficult to ascertain. Thus, if any breach occurs and is not remedied or is unable to be remedied to PFL's reasonable satisfaction with five business days, fighters shall promptly pay PFL liquidated damage is equal to twice the sum of the show and fight amount and win bonus amount set forth herein for fighters then next MMA bout. PFL will also retain its right to pursue other available uh, remedies of law and equity. So if the fighter, according to this, the fighter breaches the exclusivity uh, agreement here, right? That in other words, the fighter shall have the, the PFL shall have the exclusive right to promote and exploit all the fighters MMA bouts throughout the territory uh, and, uh, all stuff like that. Uh, if they, if they breach that, then they PFL can charge them, basically find them twice what their show and win amount would be for their next fight on top of whatever additional punishments they come up with. Can you give us an example of how it would be breached? Well, according to this, I mean, one thing would be like if, uh, if if you showed the the showed the fight uh, uh, somewhere without the without the PFL's permission because they have okay. the right the exclusive right to broadcast it if uh, if you and that could include putting it on you know, let's say YouTube or something that's right? what I was going for yeah. what if they put their fight up on YouTube I mean or technically they... it's probably a violation can I ask this then okay what if someone else took their fight and, you know, spliced it up and made a highlight reel and gave it to them and they posted it on their own social media. Would that constitute a breach? If someone else did it? If, hear me out. Listen. Okay. All right. Let's say a fighter has a buddy that makes highlight reels and that buddy makes a highlight reel for said fighter and he gives him that highlight reel. Now, that fighter didn't make that highlight reel, but he hosts it up on his YouTube. Would that constitute breaking uh, the, the agreement here, the exclusivity agreement? Well, it technically could, because even though that someone else did it, a third party, if they, if they assume that he was responsible for that third party doing it because he gave him the footage or whatever. Uh, the, the interesting fact here is... I'm not the, saying the, he gave the footage. I'm saying this guy got the footage on his own. Maybe he he recorded the fight, whatever. You know how high, highlight real yeah. guys work. They they snatch footage from multiple fights. Let's say he does that. But part of the footage that he grabs is, say, from his most recent fight that falls within this contract. That's what I'm asking. Maybe he didn't give him the footage, but somebody else grabbed it. And because he uploaded it, would that make him well, culpable here? I mean, no, no, because a third party did it. You okay. can't be held uh, culpable for a third party. Okay. I was assuming that he was giving the footage to the no, third no, party. No, no, no. Yeah. You, you know how the highlight reelers work. But yeah. the reason I was asking that is because he's uploading that content on his own YouTube. Even though he didn't make it, could he fall under the this I mean, this technically, yeah, probably because he is using footage that he okay. doesn't have the rights to. But but it's what's interesting is if he was in the UFC, the UFC, and this is comes directly out of the antitrust lawsuit. We, this was a contract change that was one of those changes they made because of the antitrust lawsuit back in 2017. Uh, if you're in the UFC, they will let you take, I think, three different clips of up to 20 seconds each, so a minute of footage, and you can do whatever you want for your promotional video. So a UFC fighter could probably do that with a few clips. 
When they no- get those three clips, does the UFC still retain those three clips? Like, let's say they take those three clips and they churn out some awesome highlight reel. And the UFC sees that highlight reel going viral and they decide to co-opt it. So when the UFC gives them their three 20-second clips, do the UFC still get to use those same clips? Well, they get, the UFC still gets permission to use those clips. They're given, And they're giving those fighters the permission to use those clips uh, solely for their for non-monetary reasons, in other words, like promotional oh. videos and stuff, the, on their own website, they're not. They're they can't use it for commercials. They can't put it in commercials. They can't use it for you know advertising. So it's basically like I have a clip. I'm going to be on a talk show. I want to show one of my fights. I'm allowed to use this 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 wow. clip. Wow. Okay. So that but that, that's something the UFC lets the fighters have uh, permanently. You know, even when after they're done with their UFC career, where I don't see that in the PFL contract. Uh, although the PFL wasn't didn't go through an antitrust lawsuit that forced them to make changes, so that might be part of it. What about Section 7, fighter obligation? Now, what is a fighter's obligation as far as, let's say, being on time? And what is the punishment for not being on time? (laughs) To access part two of this episode, you must be a paid subscriber. To do that, go to heynottheface.substack.com and subscribe then come back tomorrow and listen to part two. Ow! Ow! Not the face! Ooh! Ooh! Okay, the face!